Hello, this is Albrecht Koppenhofer. I will talk to you now about biologic control of white grubs using insect pathogenic or entomopathogenic nematodes. This is for the 2020 virtual Rutgers field day in turfgrass. A little bit background on these nematodes now. So in nature, they're obligate lethal parasites of insects. They have a symbiotic relationship with certain bacteria, very specific. There is well over 100 species that either fall into the genus Heterorhabditis or Steinerinema. They have different behaviors to actively, actively go after hosts and find them. Uh, host range varies from some species pretty broad to some rather specific, as we'll see in one of them today. They can be easily mass produced, um, either in insects or even in greater quantities in the billions um, using fermenters and media. And in nature, they have the ability to recycle uh, in their host and give potentially some long lasting effects thereby. This is the life cycle of these nematodes. And you can see the only stage that can live outside the host is the on top infective juvenile stage. They use different behaviors now to find a host, penetrate that host through natural openings such as mouth, anus, uh, the breathing openings, or even thin parts of the cuticle. They get into the body cavity of the host, release these symbi symbiotic bacteria that they carry with them in that stage, and then bacteria multiply. And if the host is susceptible, susceptible to the combination of nematode and bacteria, it will die within one or two days. The bacteria break down the host tissues and convert it basically into a nutrient broth. And now the nematodes start developing and feed on that nutrient broth, including the bacteria at that point, go through a total of up to three generations until the host is consumed from the inside and hundreds to hundreds of thousands of these infected juveniles now leave that host to start the whole cycle again. The bacteria as they multiply, produce pigments that can change the color of the host, like you see on top in the left, uh, Heteropteris biophora turns this caterpillar, nice reddish, can be orange to brick red. Or in the lower, uh, lower middle and uh, right side, you see uh, a white grub infected. You see in the middle how the bacteria, I mean the nematodes, shine through the cuticle. And then if they're on the right side, the cuticle is removed, you see how that host is like completely filled with these different stages of these uh, nematodes at that point, or uh, bottom uh, left you see a uh, grub infected by Steinonema scarabee. We'll talk about that a little bit more today, which kind of turns the host kind of like tan yellowish color. There has been for a long time the species Heterorhabditis bacteriophora available in the turf market, which in turf grass you know would be used against white grubs or maybe bill bugs. There are a couple of larger companies, many, many small ones, but among the larger ones that produce these nematodes primarily in vitro, in fermenters, uh, is BASF. The, the product is uh, Nemesis G. Then there's Copper, the product Terranem Nam, that's for North America. And Biologic is another company that produces Heteromask. More recently, another species has become available, Steiner Nema Scarabe. It's a species I found in New Jersey about 20 years ago. This one is particularly effective, but rather specific to white grubs. And for the last four years, there has been a product based on it and produced in Canada and sold there as a Nemagard by a company called Lawn Life. And this year is the first time they have also been selling it in the US. Now, let's look at white grubs. When we look at white grubs, there are generally many different species that can occur here in New Jersey and surrounding areas. Typically, oriental beetle is the dominant species, then followed by Asiatic garden beetle and Japanese beetle, but there is a few other species like northern mass chafer that can be pretty common. This is a summary of uh, many field trials uh, testing Heterorhabditis bacteriophora at a standard rate of 1 billion infective juveniles per acre and then a lower rate of about 40% of that. And it was tested, applied in mid-September against uh, mostly third stage larvae, against Japanese beetle and so on. You can see against Japanese beetle, at least at a high rate, it can do a pretty good job if uh, provided uh, the right conditions like moisture, uh, 70, 80% control, not so much at a lower rate. 
Uh, but we see with the other species, Oriental Beetle, European Schaefer, Asiatic Garden Beetle, Northern Mass Schaefer, it doesn't do quite as well. You know, you might get 50% or so on average, but not more than that typically. So control using Heterorhabditis bacteriophora or H. bacteriophora with the Japanese beetle seems feasible if you, you know, treat them the right way. Um, but with other species, maybe not so, you might have to use at least 2 billion per acre, which gets pretty expensive. Or in general, um, it's better to do earlier applications against younger stages. Because, as you see here in a lab study, but we've seen similar results also in a greenhouse, is if you look at the graph against Japanese beetle, oriental beetle, two different rates of H. bacteriophora, you can see that as the grubs get bigger, first, first through third end star, they become less susceptible, the less mortality caused uh, by this nematode. So what does that mean? It means we should probably do applications before mid-September, better mid-August to early September, when you tend to have more second stage larvae. Also, early applications give the nematodes more time to be more active at higher soil temperatures um, and recycle, and then their progeny might kill some more grubs, so that would be good. But of course, the early application is also hotter and drier, and so water can be more restricting. So this new species we found, Steinonema scarabae, in, in the early 2000s in New Jersey. Um, unlike Heterobditis bacteriophora, um, it's, it's much more specific to white grubs. We found it in causing epizootics in Japanese beetle and oriental beetle grubs. And we found it with years of research to be extremely virulent, much more so than other species, to these white grubs, and also to a wider range of white grub species. On the other hand, it didn't really care much about a lot of other insects. Yes, just quickly, on the left you see an early stage of inf infection with this Steinonema scarabi. So it's kind of yellowish, creamy colored. And over time, that infestate infection in the grub turns a little bit more creamy, yellowish brown. Here we see the same data again in red for Bacteriophora, as we've seen before, and then in yellow, Stanley Muscarbi at the same two rate, 1 billion and 0.4 billion. And, and you can see that Stanley Muscarbi, even against Japanese beetle, generally performs better, especially at the lower rate. This is after 21 days. Uh, but against these other species, you see that it is very clearly, um, especially oriental, the European shape, Asiatic garden beetle, it is a lot more virulent and effective uh, than H. bacteriophora. So, with that knowledge, we can then recommend that, you know, based on a typical life cycle here for, in this case, Japanese beetle, but other species are very similar. H. bacteriophora should be applied ideally a lighter box here between early August to maybe late September, but the optimal timing would be probably more mid-August to early September, targeting first instars and primarily second instars, and not so many third instars, because the smaller ones are more susceptible. Uh, Sinonema scarabi, on the other hand, the timing would be a little later because they like it cooler and, and apparently they're just as effective against the larger stages against, as against the small ones. So mid-August to mid-September would be better, but you can also apply it in May, you know, once it warms up, you know, like close to 60 and above, ideally, um, they can be quite effective in spring too. Mm, but the optimal time then would be more like late August to mid-September targeting first, I mean second and and third instar larvae before they can cause damage, um, but not so early so that it's a little bit cooler and, and it's easier to keep uh, the soil moist. Now here's some general instructions on how to apply these nematodes in general. They don't live terribly long, so the half-life of these infective juveniles that you apply in the soil is only about three to six weeks, or during that time, every time, you're left with about only half of what was there at the beginning of the period. Uh, so you should really only apply them when the target is present. They're also susceptible to UV light and high temperatures, so accordingly, it would be better to apply them early evening or in the morning to avoid those conditions. They tend to work best a temperature between about 60 and 90 degree, 93 degrees Fahrenheit, and with an optimum for most species from about 70 to 85. But for S. scarabi, yeah, probably you can go down to close to 60 and they will be quite effective still. 
Um, so, what does that mean? That applications before mid-May and after September generally will be less effective or not effective if it gets too cool. How do you store and handle these nematodes? Well, generally follow, as for anything, package instructions. They come in all kinds of formulations. Generally, you should apply them as soon as possible after receiving, because most of the formulations don't last terribly long, and if many of them you're actually supposed to keep cool, even refrigerate, then maybe up to a month. Uh, for Stanley Mascara B, Nemagard, the product, that's um, supposedly you can keep them for three months at room temperature. I would still use them as fast as possible. Uh, and if you can't do that, then and keep them cool, like you know, ideally in a fridge or certainly below 60 degrees. These nematodes in Asia survive in winter, but they have time to adapt to the, the freezing. You can't just throw them into a freezer and they will die. Similarly, you can't keep them in a hot vehicle, um, just like kids, you know. It just gets too hot in there for anything. And, and also you cannot leave them in a spray tank for long periods because especially if they stand in the sun, those spray tanks can get pretty darn hot. So nematodes generally live in water in a way, even in the soil, they live in the water that surrounds the soil particles and fills the pores. So, and they move most effectively on, at a moderate soil moisture. Um, if it's too dry or if uh, the, the soil is saturated, they can't move quite as effectively. Um, so if the soil is dry and or hot, it would be better before you do the application to apply a little water, like maybe a tenth of water, a tenth of an inch of water would be good. Once you have done the application, you should water them in off the foliage, at least below the soil, on the soil uh, onto the soil surface, so for that would you would need about a tenth of an inch of water. Um, but for soil insects like white grubs, it would be better to use a little bit more water, at least two tenths, maybe a quarter of an inch, so that they actually get washed inside the thatch and soil. After that, in order to allow them to be highly effective, you want to keep the soil moisture at moderate levels for at least a week. The longer, the better. You can use all kinds of application equipment for these nematodes, uh, but they're not microscopic. So if you just let them sit around in water, they will settle. So in the spray tank, you need to keep them agitated. Otherwise, you will have them highly concentrated at the bottom. Sprayer screens should be 50 mesh or coarser, better even to remove the screen and recalibrate. Uh, pressure should be kept under 200 PSI and spray volume the more water you can use, the better. You want to use at least two gallons per thousand to get them, you know, as far down as possible with the water, uh, with the spray right away. And better even if you can use as much as five gallons. Now, here is some research we did with the Steinani Mascara B. Not the, not the product Nemagard, but just the nematodes you reproduced in the lab. But this is a long-term study. We applied nematodes just at the very beginning of this four-year period. We did two more experiments like this with similar results. We applied three different rates. You can see them here at the bottom. Uh, we used a billion per acre, 40% of that, and 16% and, uh, of that, which is so about an eighth of a billion. And so to our surprise, we didn't quite expect that after 30 days, rather than the data we showed, we showed before was 21 days, so they have time to reproduce, obviously. After 30 days, even the lowest rate, one eighth of a, of a billion, had wiped out all the grubs, 100%. That was a bit extreme, it's not what we wanted, but <laughs> it, it happened. And, and so after that, for a four years period, you can see on the top graph in yellow, they suppressed the white grub numbers compared to the untreated plots uh, in yellow. And you can see why, in part, because in the lower graph, you see the number of these nematodes uh, per 200 gram soil. And you can see that after application, rather than numbers going down, they actually went up because they obviously, over the first 30 days, reproduced. And that's why they cost such high mortality, higher than in the previous data I had shown. And then they persisted. But over the summer, the numbers went down because, well, they couldn't reproduce in spring because they had wiped out all the grubs in fall already. But you can see how the nematodes persisted, but, you know, quite variable over time. And you can also see how over the long time, after three, four years, we had few of them also in the untreated plots, which 
um, is somewhat responsible for the somewhat lower numbers of white grubs uh, in the last year in the untreated plots. So, this nematode, so as I said, can provide very long-term control under right conditions. If you want to have a little bit more information uh, about all this, uh, you can go to my webpage here, where you find extension presentations or publications. Um, or if you have more questions or need clarifications, you can also uh, email me or give me a phone call. Thank you for your attention.